It's great to see you all. And uh, I've got the uh, distinct honor and, ple and pleasure of uh, introducing Kevin Chamberlain. Uh, Kevin uh, is a friend and, and, uh, and fellow docent. But a little background, Kevin was uh, born in Washington State, but uh, moved here as a youngster and was raised in Carmel. So he, he grew up, he went, he attended the uh, 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 Buna Sarah uh, uh, school at the Mission, and then he went to Carmel High. Uh, <laughs> sounds like Vicky, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, he's uh, an electronics engineer, and for the last 35 years, he's been designing computers and devices and circuitry for all kinds of applications. Um, but it's really what he does in his spare time that is, that is the most fascinating, uh, and that is that uh, one thing, he's a top-notch photographer. He's captured some beautiful images of uh, Point Lobos. But another thing is that he's an accomplished musician. And uh, uh, it, there is some, the music that you were just hearing and what Sandy's going to turn up just right now is uh, music that he composed. He plays guitar, he plays a piano, uh, and but the, some of the, the backbone of his hobbies over going back to the time uh, he, when he was a boy, is to learn more and more about history, particularly the history of the, the uh, Monterey Peninsula and Point Lobos. So what you're going to hear today is sort of the, uh, aside from the music, is the sort of the flowering of a seed planted long ago when he was a boy listening to the old timers down at the mission talking about bygone days. And so now he's got a few uh, uh, shreds of information to share with us, shards of information to share with us about those bygone days. Kevin Chamber. Um, it's about the um, how the point, how the reserve was was created, and who did it. Um, when I became a docent, um, I my docent project. We did projects back then was a, a, a history-based project, which was uh, the history of Point Lobos and how uh, Point, Point Lobos got its name, you know, uh, versus, you know, um, its original name, which was uh, Punta de Carmelo, because it was known as Carmelo Point. And, but people called it Lobos uh, be, uh, because of the sea lions that were there. Um, and I remember uh, talking to uh, Kurt Loach about, you know, how did the reserve happen? You know, what, you know, it, you look at Pebble Beach, you know, that that's not a reserve, sadly. Um, that's not even a park. It's private land. You know, what what is it that kept people from grabbing that this piece of land here? And. Um, and, the, and also, who did it? Um, and the funny thing is, is no one seemed to know that it was forgotten. You know, what happened at that time to uh, create the reserve that we know? So um, I'm going to start back in uh, 1925 because that's when it really started. Um, it actually had been going on for years that there were meetings being held uh, and people advocating that Point Lobo should be a, a park of some kind, a county park or a state park or a national park. And um, it almost always went nowhere. So um, one of the events that happened in 1925 was that there was state park legislation put forward. Um, the legislation was um, basically uh, put forward by the Save the Redwoods League. Um, Newton Drury, who was the secretary or general secretary of Save the Redwoods, basically he ran Save the Redwoods at that time. He, him and a, a number of other, other con conservationists put this legislation forward. But, and it passed 
um, almost unanimously, unanimously by the legislature, but Governor um, Richardson vetoed it. And because of um, logging interests, and, and um, um, this is the same Governor Richardson who's the Richardson Grove is named after in, uh, and of course later he said uh, he regretted his decision at the time. So also uh, after that legislation was vetoed, you know, there was a lot of public, uh, you know, uh, push to, uh, for parks. And there was a meeting held in Carmel and the, um, Mayors uh, uh, of Carmel and former mayors of Carmel were there. Uh, Mayor of uh, Monterey and Pacific Grove, a lot of uh, uh, other citizens that you know, well-known citizens. And their representative of uh, Charles B. Wing, who later would become the uh, first uh, director of the state parks, um, there also. Uh, another person who was, there, who was there was Julian Burnett, who was A.M. Allen's son-in-law, because the meeting was um, talking about how Point Lobos could be made into a state park. So Julian Burnett presented A.M. Allen's thoughts and ideas on that, um, first stating that they didn't really trust state, the state to, to do a park, um, and they were against it. So also, and this was strange when I first looked, found these uh, articles, the um, Monterey County Board of Supervisors voted to approve the map of the Carmelito town site. And why would they do that? You know, it's, it seems strange. But they were attempting to basically declare that Point Lobos was open to the public. And um, so I just want to quickly stick back. Most, most of you have been through the history of uh, how the area was um, um, acquired by Abner Bassett and Joseph Emery, and they laid out the uh, Carmelito town site um, and started to sell lots. And, but key to this, what later happened when they um, sold lots, they declared that a portion of the port was reserved as a park for the uh, free use and pleasure of the public. Now, um, they were talking about the Cypress Grove. Okay. So, um, the thing about this is this, um, this uh, development was never fully approved. You know, it was submitted, but they didn't pursue it. They did sell lots. Um, and quite a few lots. So when Ian Allen came along, he was actually hired by um, uh, Joseph Emery, and um, he was hired to come in and open the mine that was uh, not operating at that time. The, the 1890s were a, uh, a time of uh, depression. There was a uh, stock crash in 1990 or 1893, and um, it uh, uh, it was the worst depression up to that point for in the U.S. So um, the mine failed, and it, it never was a real good uh, proposition in the first place. Um, but that's why Alan came here. Um, he liked what he saw. He moved his whole family down there and uh, ended up acquiring Point Lobos, basically for taking on the debt of Emory, uh, uh, about seven thousand dollars worth of debt, plus some money that uh, to make it a, a legal transaction. Um, there's lots of things I can tell you about uh, over the years. Uh, facts like uh, um, Alan, or, or yeah, Am Allen owned the mine, but he didn't actually own the mining rights. <laughs> Emory kept the mining rights and. Um, Alan was to pay so much per uh, uh, whatever uh, packet of, uh, of coal that was shipped or sand uh, out of the coal chute. So um, also at that time, Sadie Allen, um, she um, urged Alan to put up a gate and kind of protect 
the uh, um, the private park that they created there at the time. So coming back to 1925, where the, the Monterey County supervisors, um, this was pushed by a, um, a supervisor by the name of John L. D. Roberts. Now his thought was, well, we'll just approve the development there and then the streets will be public and the park will be public. We'll just declare it. Um, you know, it was just a political move that they made. Um, but John L. D. Ro Roberts is an interesting guy who's um, really impacted the um, peninsula here. You know, when you go over to Seaside, he's a founder of Seaside. That's John L. D. Roberts. When you uh, that statue that in front of Seaside City Hall, um, he lobbied Theodore Roosevelt to bring in four door. <coughs> He also was a main uh, person pushing for the Carmel San Simeon Highway. And part of that uh, highway um, push was, uh, uh, that's kind of led him to Point Lobos and you know, a reason you, know, you want some attractions along the highway. And uh, Point Lobos was certainly an attraction. It was already a park, been world famous since the 1890s. So, um, he contended that the um, oops, that the um, streets were public and that the park was public because of this um, development. So it, time went on, and he and uh, uh, Roberts was threatening, you know, to uh, to just well, he declared that, but it, it really didn't work. Allen really maintained that uh, uh, gate and uh, didn't allow people to treat it as a public, uh, open land. But um, and then through that year, Roberts would complain that the DA wasn't pressing a suit. Um, and then, uh, I don't think the DA was really enthused about it. Um, maybe the DA didn't think that it was something they could win. I don't know. Um, also about this time, there were rumors that A.M. Allen um, refused an offer of a million dollars for it. And this, pro this offer probably came from um, 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 uh, uh, what's his name? The uh, uh, Del Monte Properties Company. Okay, so also at this time, in the newspaper record here, um, there were groups, uh, veterans groups, it was only seven years after the, uh, World War I, who were pushing for a memorial site. So like we have a veterans memorial park uh, up in Monterey, well, that's what they wanted Point Lobos to be. Um, so, and they were, you know, with the county declaring that it's open land, that was um, the natural thing. So at the same time, there's kind of two tracks. There's what the county is doing. There's also what uh, people who um, were just private citizens. Um, this is uh, Carolyn Phelps Stokes, Stokes Hunter. She uh, is an interesting um, character in this. She was a New York, uh, you know, from one of the richest families in New York. Um, I mean, these pictures are online. There's, there's, uh, it's easy to find pictures of her as a child and, and, and with her family because at the time, um, Anson Phelps Stokes, her father, would have been, you know, that that would have been as, you know, like saying Rockefeller in New York. So um, she moved to Pell Beach, 1922, and. Um, her husband, which her, who was uh, Robert Hunter, and this is an interesting link. Her husband, Robert Hunter, uh, who was a sociologist and a writer, um, he was friends with people like Upton Sinclair, Mark Twain, uh, Jack London. But he was, um, uh, and he uh, worked with the poor in New York and the settlements around 1903. In fact, when they were married, they moved 
to a modest house in New York, and the and the newspaper articles were all that um, that uh, Carolyn Phelps Stokes was moving into the slums. You know, <laughs> it wasn't true, but it was. She was uh, a, a, a bit of a, 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 you know, the press um, would go after those things at the time. Robert Hunter was also an avid uh, amateur golfer. And in fact, he was a cha championship golfer, which, you know, he was uh, uh, in uh, 18, or 1918, he taught at Berkeley uh, economics and um, uh, politics and things like that. And he um, um, decided to move, he moved to Pebble Beach and he went to work for Samuel uh, F.P. Morris. And um, he's actually, um, in, at the same time, Carolyn Hunter came to know Point Hobos. But um, Robert Hunter uh, became one of the designers with uh, Alistair McKenzie of the Cypress Point Golf Course. Um, there was another person who will later talk about. Uh, her name was Marion Hollins. She was a, a well-known golfer. She brought uh, polo and golf to Pebble Beach. She was the first one uh, uh, to do it. And she worked for Morris also at the time. Um, so there's kind of a strange <coughs> golfing connection here because Carolyn Hunter um, um, at the time, she knew Samuel Morris, and she wrote a letter to him. She had heard about the controversies at Point Lobos, and she, uh, you know, the map of the Carmelito Sound town site had become public, and people knew about it. And she was worried um, about that town site going forward. Um, it really wasn't designed as a, uh, when you look at the, the town site map, it's not designed as a uh, resort. It's designed as a small mining town, you know. The lots are very small and, and there's a lot of them. But um, his reply was very, really appealing. You know, in it, uh, Morris talks about how he actually owns two of the Carmelito sound site lots and was holding them from Morris, or holding them from Allen, because Allen was trying to buy back all the lots. He had been trying for 25 years to get control of all the lots so he could redo uh, the, um, the map with the county. And uh, um, so the other thing that Morris talks about is, is um, the fact that, that uh, he's been in discussions with uh, A.M. Allen about something, probably buying Point Lobos, but Allen wouldn't sell it to him. Thank God. <laughs> but you can see that um, he talks about this portion of the park that, that was reserved as a park. And you know, it ends with, you know, we have the thing pretty well in hand. I don't think there's anything to be concerned about here. You know, pretty much condescending, you know, don't worry, your pretty little head, we'll take care of it. <laughs> you know? um, so, um, Carolyn Hunter um, would later write to Newton Drury commenting on this letter, and she basically said that uh, this letter, instead of being reassuring, was extremely alarming. The fact that um, Point Lobos would be treated just like Pebble Beach, that means there's development. And she didn't think correctly that Point Lobos could stand any development. So also at this time, um, the controversy between the county and Allen starts to heat up. Um, John L.D. Roberts sends uh, the county roadmaster, uh, A.F. Serrano, to take down Allen's Gate to um, open Point Lobos to the public. Well, Allen put the gate back up and threatened to shoot <laughs> Serrano if he showed, up, showed back up to take it down again, and basically guarded it. And you know, I've heard these stories 
about how Ellen guarded the gate and, and, uh, and stories about the lawsuit, but they were all as separate stories, and this really connects them all together. So um, there are a lot of articles and controversy in the paper at, the, at this time about that uh, event, and um, it really appears that um, John Roberts was trying to go to Allen into suing the county and, um, you know, figuring it would be better that if Allen was suing to get his land back than if the county was suing Allen to get his land. You know, I, I, it really looks like that. Uh, I can't say for sure that that was the case, but um, he talked about it in articles in the Pinecone and the Monterey Herald. So, again, at the same time, in, in, um, Carolyn Hunter writes to William Kent. William Kent is the um, congressman who worked with, um, uh, uh, who wrote the National Park legislation. And uh, he worked with John Muir on that. And uh, he's also the uh, person who um, bought and owned uh, the uh, Muir Woods and donated it to the state. He was older at, at this time, and um, he suggested she contact Newton Drury uh, to pursue this. So she starts to get organized. So these are the, the main uh, players on the conservationist side. So Newton Drury, who uh, um, he was the secretary of the uh, Save the Redwoods League. He um, also later he became the director of the state parks and national parks director during the war. Um, his brother Aubrey Drury, who um, was kind of a person who worked in the background raising money um, for the Redwoods League. Together they had a firm that was uh, public relations. Um, Aubrey Drury actually became the uh, secretary of the Point Lobos League, and um, he generated most of the first uh, books about uh, the guidebooks at Point Lobos. But he was a key key figure. Uh, she also talked to Duncan McDuffie. Uh, McDuffie, um, he was a developer, conservationist. He was a um, a, a mountaineer. Um, McDuffie, um, Joseph LeConte, and um, James Hutchison were the uh, mountaineers who opened uh, the first uh, opened the uh, John Muir Trail from Yosemite to um, Kings Canyon. They scoped out that route, and um, but McDuffie was later. Uh, greatly involved in the acquisition of Point Lobos. Um, William Coby, who was the uh, secretary of the, um, <coughs> the um, Sierra Club under John Muir, later became president of the Sierra Club, um, was also involved. Um, John Merriam, who um, the uh, president and one of the founders of the Save the Redwoods League, um, he was also president of the Carnegie Institution. Both uh, organizations were, were key and important in the um, acquisition and the creation of reserve. So John Merriam was a driving force in the background of this whole fight. So, um, about this time in uh, November, uh, Carolyn Hunter and her husband Robert uh, meet with A.M. Allen. And A.M. Allen seems open to, you know, to Point Lobos becoming a park of some time. And they learn things like that Allen, um, you know, had his own ideas uh, of creating a park and supporting it with development on um, surrounding lands of some, somehow, but creating a private park. Um, and that he wasn't about to sell it to any developers. And uh, pointing out that, you know, he's been a developer for 
35 years, and he could have developed it at any time. Um, and here's when Allen states that he wouldn't sell um, Twin Logos for a million dollars, and that's true because he was offered a million dollars <laughs> and he wouldn't sell. So that was overall a good meeting. Um, in December of 1926, on December 9th, uh, an organizing meeting for the Point Lobos League or Point Lobos Association was held at the, Saint, or at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. So at that meeting, um, Duncan McDuffie, um, Newton Drury, who gave a history of uh, the Save the Redwoods League, Willis Jepson was there. He talked about the cypress trees and the fragility and how rare they really were. Uh, William Bay was another um, conservationist who was there. He he had actually attended a meeting in Pacific Grove at the um, uh, old uh, original museum there uh, about saving the cypress groves in Pebble Beach in 1905 uh, and talked about that. Um, also at this meeting, Allen sent his son-in-law, Julian Burnett. Now this picture, of course, is much later. It's the only picture I could ever find of Julian Burnett. But he was married to Helen, Helen Allen's daughter. And um, he gave Allen's side to this. And uh, Allen, you know, basically, um, there's, you know, detailed minutes of these meetings from multiple sources. So. Um, um, Basically, about Allen's plan to re-subdivide the Point Lobos, create a large 80-acre park, and support it with um, uh, development outside the park. So it's not the same park we would know. Um, it basically was, if you take the Cy Cypress Groves and the North Shore areas, that's what Allen was thinking. You, you have to remember at the time that um, the um, there was development there, you know, Whalers Cove had um, houses and infrastructure and all kinds of stuff there already. Um, the area around Bird Island was, you know, there were hardly any trees, you know, it was open fields. So this was the, um, this is a hand-drawn pencil drawing for the Point Lobos Association that I found in the records. Um, but the purpose was preservation, protection, education, inspiration. So between that time, January 1926, word got out that a um, organization was formed and there was an immediate backlash. Um, Carmel uh, and area residents were almost 80% against this. And um, to understand why, um, you have to understand that the state of state parks at that time, state parks in most people's minds um, um, meant this. <laughs> so they were uh, tin can campers is the terms they use, highway uh, parks. Um, and they just didn't want that. I mean, there was an element of, you know, uh, the wrong type of people coming in, you know, and, and, and you know, plus uh, there was isolationism, you know, like we just wanted our control of our area and we don't other want other people coming in. So, um, and they were right about that. That's state parks. There was no organized state parks at the time. That's what that legislation that was vetoed was trying to create. Also at this time, um, there was an article written by a columnist, her name was Annie Laurie, that's her, her uh, pen name. Her name was, uh, actual name was Winifred Bonifils. She was kind of like a, a Dear Abby, she wrote columns or like a Dear Abby um, for girls, and, and, but she also wrote columns like this which completely uninformed, you know, 
3,000-year-old pines. You know, and, 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 and it's all against Ellen and how he's going to subdivide, chop up the land, and sell it off the lots, you know, which was already proven that it's not the case. Alan was really mad about this. And he blamed the Point Lobos Association for this. Um, um, it's not, I don't think that it was their fault, but he, from this point on, it was, uh, you know, he wouldn't talk to the Point Lobos Association, the Point Lobos League, or anybody involved with the Point Lobos League, you know. But the reality was their goals really were the same, was the preservation of Point Lobos. So um, this was just one, one um, item of many articles that happened, but this particular one he wrote about, um, he, uh, uh, he specifically uh, blamed Frank Powers in Carmel, who was a, a well-known uh, Carmel uh, resident, uh, who was a friend of hers, of uh, Annie Laurie's. So Point Lobos Association went off. Um, it, it didn't do any good for them to try to be negotiating with A.M. Allen to acquire Point Lobos at the time. But there was lots of other stuff for them to do. Uh, and notably, Newton Drury was not a part of the Point Lobos Association. He was, as he should have been, above that and outside of that. He was part of the Save the Redwoods League. Also, um, um, Carol Lander asked uh, other uh, members, such as um, um, John Marion, to join, and he refused because, and it's good that he did because really uh, he later developed a good rapport with AML. Um, but in 1927, the Point Lobos Association contacted Frederick Law Olmsted to do a survey and report on Point Lobos. This is the first survey he did. Um, and uh, he showed up uh, and st did a study of it on his own. He spent about a month at, uh, at Point Lobos and came up with, with a report. The, um, the, other, the other thing that the Point Lobos Association is did was they joined in the lobbying and, and campaign for um, three bills that were now going through the legislature. 439 was a bill to create a park commission. 440 was a bill to uh, fund a uh, California statewide survey of state parks, for state parks or possible state parks. And 441 was the bill that put before the voters a $6 million bond um, legislation to, to fund acquisitions of state parks. So it was important that this pass because there's half the money because the, the, um, they only had to raise half the money and the state would match that. So this park legislation passes. The administrations had changed. Um, and um, um, so the six million, the, the, the next campaign was to um, campaign for this six million dollar bond issue going in before the voters in November of 1928. Uh, so the um, Point Lobos Association um, jumped into that fight. So in the uh, beginning of 1927, John Merriam um, meets with Margaret Allen Hudson, who happened to be in Washington because her husband was uh, Lester uh, Hudson, who was the, um, in the Navy. I don't think he was an admiral yet. But um, he, uh, uh, John Marion, uh, hears that she is there and makes a point of going to meet her, and uh, then corresponds with A.M. Allen. Um, and um, during this correspondence, um, John Merriam discovers that he's met A.M. Allen before. Um, they happen to be um, in the uh, racetrack up in, uh, when Allen was working on the racetrack up in 
um, north of uh, um, Oakland, uh, Marion was there doing a dig, and Alan provided um, specimens for it and, and helped him out during the dig. So they had already met and didn't realize that this was the same person. You know? So Alan actually visits the Allen family, or uh, Marion visits the Allen family in 1920s in the summer and gets to know them. And by all accounts, um, becomes good friends with them. Uh, and corresponds with Margaret Hudson through the years. And uh, Margaret actually seemed to be a very, uh, you know, in awe of John Marion. As it turns out, Margaret uh, went to Berkeley in 1918. She was at Berkeley. Marion was a professor at Berkeley at the time. And uh, along with uh, Robert Hunter, who was a professor at Berkeley at the time, so which is a strange coincidence. So what Alan did, or what uh, Marion did when he visited with uh, Alan in 1927 was kind of coach him on what to do to protect the cypress groves and to, you know, um, although Marion really was on the conservationist group, um, you know, they had looked at that, the lawsuit that the county was proposing or put, put forward and didn't think that the county was going to win that lawsuit. But in any case, uh, Merriam advised um, um, M. Allen. Uh, uh, I'm almost sure that uh, he connected him with uh, E.P. Meineke, who was somebody uh, that Merriam would use, or, or Newton Drury would use, to uh, you know, the forest pathologist. And uh, Meineke um, actually wrote a report um, on the um, Cypress Groves, which was almost entirely published in the uh, Carmel Pine Cone. Alan also put notices and changed the rules for the Cypress Grove area um, to protect it better. He, um, he wanted to protect it, but he also wanted the public to know that he was uh, protecting it. Uh, he took the picnic tables out, didn't allow fires or cars, which they used to allow. Um, and um, so coming around in October, finally, Allen gets his day in court because the county had filed the lawsuit the year before. And um, uh, so in October, um, the uh, court date happened. And by October 20th, uh, Allen had won. So that was really, this, this case was to whether the streets of Carmelito and the park was open to the public, which when you think about it, would not have been a good thing. You know, how can you, what would happen if we opened the gates now to anybody that comes in at any time you want? You know, it, it would kind of be a disaster. Um, even then, it would have been a disaster. People come in and do what they want. They build fires. They, cut limbs, they, you know, they camp. Um, so the county appealed to the um, California Supreme Court and loses again. So that issue was off the table and, and out of, uh, uh, you know, not affecting them. So, um, we're, we, uh, the uh, conservationists and AML were free to have a, a regular fight with each other <laughs> to try to uh, protect Point Lobos. So the, the next issue is the uh, bond legislation that's going through. Um, so the Point Lobos League or Association joint with the Sierra Club and the Redwoods League and Calaveras Big Trees Association, all these associations that were basically um, the two big, uh, two big clubs, the Sierra Club and the Redwoods League, and then all the local associations all joined together, pooled their money for a campaign. So that year, the um, um, National Conference of State Parks was held in California. 
Stephen Mather, who is the director of National Parks, did this purposely to push this legislation. Um, you'll notice that um, oh, there it is, Point Lobos Park. Also. This is a film that was sent around, probably in small meetings, to um, advocate for the um, you know voting yes on that bond issue. Point Lobos was used as as you know one of the parts, one of the the uh, primary parts that that uh, um, were being advocated for. And nobody was saying reserve at this time. They were saying parks. That uh, idea had not come oh, up yet. Are those the bones that we see? The, yes. That the one? The yes. The bones that are the remains of which are near the whaler's cabin, which we're trying to protect more, that's the same whale. And of course, the uh, veteran cypress there. There are even articles at the time about how that tree is about to fall into the water at any time. <laughs> and it looks like it was. It was actually shored up and uh, um, at the time. So the bond issue passes three to one. So, and William Colby, uh, the new chairman of the Park Commission, visits Sam Allen and basically to open negotiations. Now, Colby had met Allen before uh, in 1923, uh, um, sounding him out uh, even at that time about Point Lobos uh, when they were trying to protect the Cypress Groves in Pebble Beach. Um, so, Allen health begins to fail at this time, and um, his daughters ask them to just hold off negotiation. Also at this time, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted does a study of all the state park sites in California, which was a massive undertaking. Um, he he uh, had his uh, mentee, George Vaughn, help him on this. George would later uh, spend two years at Point Lobos and um, survey every start, uh, every possible, of, I think there was 350 sites they surveyed, and there, of which there was like 150 or 200 that they listed. Most of them had become state parks. So um, meanwhile, this was happening at Point Lobos. <laughs> This is from the movie Evangeline. It was a big film. And the British invaded Point Lobos at that time. It's interesting to know that this, this movie set was the most extensive of any of them. And they uh, did things that you would not. You would, and part of it's due to um, Alan was sick at the time, and, and um, I think that they just, I don't think they asked to do some of these things. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, you know, they, they started a fire next to the last remaining cypress groves. <laughs> You can see the uh, uh, soldiers down at the British soldiers here. You can see all the spectators up here. Off trail, I might say. <laughs> yeah. So, 1930, Am Allen passes away. And he made his uh, daughters, three daughters, the sole ex executors of his will. Um, also, 1930, Margaret Hudson writes to John Marion to um, basically reopen negotiations. So, 
So um, they were pretty much adamant they wanted to protect it as it was, and they were worried about the state getting a hold of the land and just doing what it wants. They were worried about, you know, yes, this administration may say they're not going to build infrastructure and do whatever it wants, but the next one might, you know? And they were looking for a way to protect it in perpetuity. So um, this is also at this time that you can see that golfing interests still were interested in Point Lobos, even though this is an ad for Del Monte uh, in Pebble Beach, the picture is not in Pebble Beach, and it even says it's Point Lobos. <laughs> so, um, anyway, the negotiations proceed with the, the Hudson daughters, or the, I mean the Allen daughters, Margaret Hudson and, and uh, Eunice Riley and Helen Burnett. And it's, you know, the issues are appraisals, price, where are the boundaries of the park, um, their appraisers, uh, the state's appraisers were a little lower than the uh, family thought, how it always is. Um, but then they hit another snag here because uh, remember I talked about uh, Marion Hollins, who was a well known golfer, and um, she had developed the Pasatiempo golf course over by Santa Cruz. So she had taken what she had learned at uh, uh, under, working under Morris and kind of went off on her own. And um, she was at a meeting with uh, Newton Drury and Colby and most, a lot of the Allen family, but not Margaret and um, Eunice. Just Helen was there, and Allen's wife was there. But, Collins was saying that the land could be worth as much as $1.5 million, but then when they go through the meeting and talk about it, it really is, when it's developed, it may be worth that much. They, she, she implied that, that she would be coming with an offer. So the state, at, they weren't in a position to do anything at that time, so they just kind of backed off and see what would happen. The state did have the power to uh, condemn uh, uh, which, as nothing happened for some months, that they did prepare a condemnation suit to at least establish the fair market value of the land. Anyway, no offers come through from home. So, um, again, uh, another thing, this was never known before. I found the letters, though, that uh, um, Horace Albright, who was director of national parks, visited Point Lobos during the summer of 32 and was greatly impressed with it. So the uh, Allen family and Colby finally work out a deal, um, or they start to work out a deal. The deal would include a gift of 20 acres or 15 acres, whichever uh, of the Cypress Grove, but with restrictions. The family uh, had thought, and this idea actually was suggested by John Merriam in 1927, that they could put restrictions on how the land was used. So they could say, if, uh, if the cypress groves were decimated or taken out or something happened to them, that the land would revert back to the family. Um, so Margaret Allen writes to John Merriam because she's concerned. The restrictions only apply to the 20-acre Cypress Grove and not the rest of Point Lobos, which was worked out as to where it would be. And that was a concern of her. So John Merriam writes a memorandum about a possible reservation. Really, it was... Um, kind of the idea of creating a reserve at Point Lobos. So this, this is the final uh, map, and you can see that the Cypress Grove was a gift. The majority of the land, $600,000 worth, was uh, uh, for $600,000. There was an option for the land around Whaler's Cove, $31,000, which was exercised almost immediately. Um, 
but there was this chunk of land, option four, which there was a 10-year option on that land, and that wasn't exercised. And, the, you know, the 10-year option expired, and um, I think World War II got in the way of this. It's just that they were never able to actually um, So, uh, Horace Albright writes to John D. Rockefeller regarding the agreement. I was so impressed by Point Lobos that I was prepared to recommend it to the government as a national monument. But the state found it impossible to acquire it for a park. So this, this is like he was watching, but he wasn't going to do anything and, you know, he had John Rockefeller in, in as a backup. But uh, Albright, uh, we, we were good friends with John Rockefeller. In fact, when he visited, he uh, got an, uh, he was shown around by an artist named uh, Bergdorf. And um, Bergdorf gave an etching to um, Albright, who gave it to Rockefeller and hang, hung on his office wall at etching the point of So in October, they had a deal, but they didn't have the money. They were still $150,000 short. So they raised half of it. So um, Carolyn Hunter raised almost, you know, raised another $100,000. And they hit a, a wall at, they were $45,000 short. Um, and you know, remember this was in the depression. It was hard to get money out of people. Although, you know, Carolyn Hunter knew lots of rich people. Um, but it was solved when Newton Drury realized that the Prairie Creek Redwoods had been a gift, all uh, a complete gift in itself, and there was no matching funds. So he talked to the um, Attorney General, and he got an okay to just swap the matching funds for the Prairie Redwood. And, and um, Redwoods League put up the remaining money, and uh, it was done, and the deal was done. So in February 8, 1933, um, the state gained control of Point Lobos. Um, but they weren't done. It, it wasn't officially in a reserve. The plan uh, was to make it a reserve. So a large study was started. Uh, George Vaughn, who uh, worked for Frederick Law Olmsted, spent two years at the cabin, living in the cabin, and uh, doing a, a landscape study and survey. At the same time, there were scientists um, doing uh, studies of the animals, plants, um, the whole point. There, uh, there were studies of visitors to the park. Uh, Meineke's study of the Cypress Grove was added to the report. The report itself is two inches thick. The, uh, have now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in the Bancroft Library. Most of what I found was from the Bancroft Library and the Point Lobos League records. Point Lobos League records was put together by Carolyn Hunter. She donated the um, five boxes of records to the Bancroft Library, and that's why I was able to look through them and find out all this stuff. <laughs> so there's uh, two other copies of that. One is with the Carnegie Institution. And, um, but basically, a report like this had never been done before not on a state park or a national park. Um, it became a model for a future Crater Lake State Park and the Everglades that were being worked on at the time. So I always like to contend that really there were other reserves at the time that were called reserves. They were not natural reserves. They were like game reserves. Where, like the Thule Elk Reserve, that was the only one that really proceeds, where they took some Thule Elk, put them on a ranch, and called it a reserve. <laughs> okay? So, um, Point Lobos really was the first California state reserve 
uh, a natural reserve. The word natural was added later, but the original part was was this. The Origi original reserve was this amount of land. Um, later, um, option four was not taken at the time, but the uh, surrounding islands weren't considered part of the reserve yet either. Uh, 1940, that was changed by the state legislature. So Bird Island wasn't there. And then in 1960, it was an underwater reserve, first in the nation. And then 1974, finally, Parcel 4, which is the Hudson property, where the Hudson house is, was added. So re pretty much the reserve we have today. Now, we, of course, we have the underwater, uh, or the uh, green protected areas, and, and uh, a little bit, I think, the uh, underwater reserve may be a little bit expanded now. So, a little history of the Point Lobos Foundation. Our own foundation really has links back to the original um, Point Lobos League, Point Lobos Association. And uh, it, um, the, Point Lobos or the Point Lobos League later was reconstituted by um, um, Forrest Whitaker and um, a couple other uh, people in Carmel to fight for the lands around the lagoon and for uh, the sand plant that was in Monastery Beach to fight against that. Uh, and they were pretty much successful. Um, they were also fighting against movie making at Point Lobos, which was sometimes a disaster. Um, Judd Vandiver was involved in that. And then later, we know him in, at the uh, um, the new Point Lobos Association created in 1974, or 1979 or so, 78. Uh, so each, each group was, had links to the last group. So, and of course, we do things uh, now, we try to still protect Point Lobos in our own way. First, I want to thank Kevin for this. This is a spectacular piece of research. These people who were involved in this 80 to 100 years ago, forgotten to all of us, I wouldn't know anything about this really if it weren't for Kevin. They all had something in common. They were all interested in posterity. They didn't know what our names were going to be. They didn't know what we were going to look like. They didn't know when we were going to be here, but they knew we were going to be here and they wanted us to be able to enjoy Point Lobos. And now, it falls to us. Because there are always people who want to build 20-story condos in places like this. Every generation has to protect these gems. So thank God for those people who did it back then. Thank you, Kevin. Great comments, Dan. But my question is a little simpler, but um, I'm interested in understanding the Allen family. Uh, they had three daughters, um, Crusade said Allen, and he married again and had a son. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure when they moved to Point Lobos, did they have children at that time? Yes, the daughters? three daughters were, were born uh, I don't know if they were born in Oakland or even in Chicago, but they, they moved here as young children, right. very young children. And then for the, for the son that was born later, we never hear anything more about him. He, um, I think he, he died, passed away in the uh, 50s, but his daughter is still around. She, she's uh, uh, um, part of the, the, fam the Allen family, is, 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 so his, um, his granddaughter still is around too. And the grandson, Tolkien yes. Allen, lives in Arizona. But yeah. He comes out here frequently to see his sister. What, was the, what are the restrictions on the Cypress Grove? Restrictions state that um, the, if, if they were to lose the Cypress Grove, that the land would revert back to the Allen family. Now, it only applies to the Cypress Grove, so it would be a, a very difficult and messy, complicated thing if the Allen family were to 
you know, and, and then who in the Allen family, you know, as time goes by, it gets more and more difficult. But the fact is, um, it really pushed the creation of the reserve as a, another way to, in law, protect Point Pueblos. Kevin? One of the early things that was done, Roland Wilson was hired as the first superintendent here, and his wife was hired to assist him. She got tipped all the money. But what they were doing at that time was doing everything they could to get people out of the Cypress Grove and walk other areas of the park yeah. and make that more of a protected area and not the main focus. Right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you.